So that's a piece of scripture called the Beatitudes, typically. If you heard people reference the Beatitudes, that's exactly what they're talking about. Uh, the reason is, is because uh, for a lot of the church's history, it was read in Latin. And in Latin, the translation reads, Beatus, 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 at the beginning of every line. Uh, it's traditionally translated blessed. Um, this new modern translation does happy. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, and that's not normally a piece of scripture that people associate with this time of year. And I want to explain why that is as well. But before we get into all of that, uh, there's two takeaways I want you all to have from this message today. Sometimes, I don't know if I'm a great preacher, by the way, and so sometimes I feel like I need to say, uh, this is the message, <laughs> like in one sentence, because I don't know if you're actually going to get it. So like, this is the message. Um, it's not about them, the saints. It's about us. And it's not about death. It's about life. It's not about them, it's about us. It's not about death, it's about life. That's the answer. If you walk away with that, great. Uh, and then you can tell other people, I did a good job. But we, um, So I'm thinking about this piece of scripture, and it's bringing up uh, a, to my mind one of my favorite writers. And I love to read brain candy books. And one of my favorite is by a writer named A.J. Jacobs. And he's a journalist, and he writes these books. Uh, and I've read a ton of them, but there's one that a lot of people in the jesus -y church circle know. Uh, and it's because he immerses himself incredibly in these situations and, and puts himself to these big ex like tests, experiments, and writes about what they're like. And one of them was called The Year of Living Biblically. And he was Jewish, but not really a practicing Jew. And he decided that for an entire year, I'm going to follow the Bible as literally as I possibly can. I'm going to follow every rule I can as literally as I can. Uh, there's a picture of him, Martin, if you wouldn't mind showing it. Uh, so he's, he, that's an example of what happens when you take the, I'm not going to shave my beard or cut the corners of my hair. That's one year. Um, so that's A.J. Jacobs, what he looked like because of that. I mean, one of my favorite things he said from that book was, uh, thanks, Martin. I thought it was just going to be about like not working on Friday and not shaving my beard, but he goes, before long, I real I'm up on the roof of my building at dawn, blowing a goat's horn at the start of the month because <laughs> the Bible says you have to do that. So if you're not, I want to let you know you're missing out. So uh, he had one of the rules in the Old Testament is you can't sit anywhere that uh, a woman who is menstruating has sat. And he lives in New York City, and so he can't, he's riding the subway, so he has to buy a little camp stool and like sit on his camp stool riding around in New York City. And then his wife finds out that's what she's doing. And then so at one particular time, she sits on every single thing in the house. So he had to like <laughs> sit his camp stool around. It was a great story and I loved it. And so he uh, popped up in my newsfeed a lot with all of these uh, things talking about, uh, this person is my cousin. This person is my cousin. I didn't get it. And he's got a new book coming out uh, that really speaks what we're talking about today. He gave a TED talk about it. And this is just a 90 second excerpt uh, that I want to share. Or even millions. I'm on something on Genie called the World Family Tree, which has no less than a jaw-dropping 75 million people. So uh, that's 75 million people connected by blood or marriage, sometimes both. Uh, it's, in, <laughs> it's in all seven continents, including Antarctica. I'm on it. Many of you are on it, whether you know it or not. Uh, and you can see the links. Uh, here's my cousin, Gwyneth Paltrow, who, <laughs> she has no idea I exist, but we are officially cousins. We have just 17 links between us. And uh, there's my cousin, Barack Obama. <laughs> and he is my aunt's fifth great aunt's husband's father's wife's seventh great nephew. <laughs> so, practically my older brother. Uh, <laughs> And my cousin, of course, the actor Kevin Bacon, <laughs> who is my first cousin, twice removed, wife's niece's husband's first cousin, once removed, niece's husband. So six degrees of Kevin Bacon, plus or minus several degrees. <laughs> now, I'm not boasting because all of you have famous people and historical figures in, in your tree because we are all connected. And 75 million may seem like a lot, but in a few years, it's quite likely we will have a family tree with all, almost all, seven billion people on earth. So that is, I love that because that is like modern society and the internet and science catching up to the things that the writers understood when they're putting the New Testament together. 
I mean, that's, that's the testimony that comes from Revelation and every nation is gathered. That's the testimony that comes from 1 John. We're all God's children. Uh, that deep level of interconnectedness. We're literally connected. If you have a scientific worldview, uh, if you have a really empirical worldview, we are literally connected scientifically. Uh, and this is really hard for me because I grew up in the United States of America, which is one of the most individualistic societies that's ever existed. Uh, we celebrate our individuality. We celebrate the idea of the self-made man or woman who has achieved all this with nobody's help. Uh, that's like a folk hero in our community. I remember it was really hard. I, uh, I've shared before, I moved to Chicago in my early 20s, didn't have a car, and I was riding the bus or the subway or my bike to work every single day, and it was so disorienting, and I couldn't figure out why. And it's because at the age of 24, I had never gone anywhere without two tons of steel and glass surrounding me. It was incredibly disoriented to be that close to people. I would sit on the subway and be like, what are these people doing everywhere? Like, it was really hard to actually be that connected with folks. You know, we don't even make overtures at it. Probably the closest thing we even have in our culture today to making overtures to the idea that we're actually connected with each other uh, is the political process, uh, which theoretically we all like vote and and have a share in this thing together. And uh, elections are on Tuesday. Uh, anybody here feeling connected to all of their fellow men and women uh, by virtue of the uh, electoral system coming up? Have these advertisements made you feel really connected and in it together with everyone? Uh, because if so, let me know, um, because I'm worried about you, and I want to make sure you never accidentally serve with kids or anything like that. <laughs> so, like, it doesn't work out that way. We don't have that active in our culture. And so, uh, we, have, we have this, you don't even realize how individualistic our society is. Um, and that is entirely counter to the position that we get from the Bible. Like that idea of individualism seeps into our spirituality. Like, have, have you ever heard the phrase, my individual relationship with Christ? Nowhere in the Bible. My individual walk with God? Nowhere in the Bible. That's our individual astralistic aspect. Everything's about me and through me. That, that's, our, that's us reaching up to heaven versus the other way down, and that's not right. I really have a hard time believing that the goal is you get to heaven and you get your own little cloud when you get there. So uh, look at the imagery that we get from Revelations. It talks about uh, this, this gigantic sea of just souls, creation, unified, reconciled with God, every nation. Every race, every tribe, all present. For the first time, you may be realizing there's not an American section of heaven. There's not a United States of America of heaven. It's everyone together. In our first John, uh, we get this imagery of we are all God's children. We are all part of the family. I have a feeling that when God views us, we are not viewed that individually. And so we were talking about it, uh, as I've shared before, uh, all these messages, the good parts are all written in a community with other people. Um, the bad parts are all me. Um, but the good parts all come out of community. And uh, Travis came up with a really cool illustration when we were talking, and he was sharing a trip to Europe that talked about the tapestries that line the walls, uh, formerly in castles and now in museums, and they tell the story of the community, but the individual people, as we start teasing out this imagery, the individual people are like the individual stitches in that big tapestry, and each one of those stitches is valuable and is priceless and is perfect in its own way, only in that it fits and is a part of that beautiful work. I think that is much more like how God sees us. So it's that understanding that brings us to the Beatitudes. So this is very early in Jesus's ministry. It's only page four, you know, like we're really early in this thing. And uh, just a few like verses before that, he's called his disciples. He started to go do ministry in the community. People are being healed. People are hearing the word of God in ways they've never heard it before. Things are changing. Stuff is happening and in the midst of all that, these crowds are forming, and he takes his disciples, and he goes up on a mountain next to the Sea of Galilee. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it says he talks to them, his disciples. He's talking to the insiders, the people who are going to do this work with him. You know how many disciples he has at that point? Four. 
That's it. Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, James, his brother John, that's it. And he has to outline, okay, this is what's going to happen. Happy are those people who are poor in spirit. God is with them. Happy are those who are meek and humble. God is with them. Hung, happy are the people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God is with them. He's saying, you may not recognize it now, but this is not where it ends. I need you to know that this is not where it ends. So, uh, one of the things I'm extremely passionate about is that people who are Methodists understand what it means to be Methodist. And a few weeks ago, I shared, uh, you know, the first thing you, that we would say about God in Methodist church, the first thing you need to know about God is grace. Other churches would say the first thing you need to know about God is sin. Um, and that's, their understanding of ours is very different. And I was at TCU this week, and I was eating at the cafeteria because I have, like, no money. And you, they'll take loans, <laughs> so great. And I'm eating at the cafeteria, and there's a conversation two tables over, and, it's a, and I'm overhearing it because like, it's that or study, so I'm listening to their conversation. And uh, the young man is from, the young man is there from Vietnam. There's three guys. The young man's from Vietnam, and uh, there's two guys from the United States. And the young man from Vietnam has initiated this conversation, and he's sharing. The other guys are like, they're, they have Jesus t-shirts on, so I'm assuming they're in the club. And uh, the young man has said, like, I wasn't allowed to learn about Christianity in Vietnam. I want to know. I want to hear what this is about. And uh, the young men who were with them were obviously there to, like, evangelize or say, like, this is what the faith is about. And I was so fascinated to overhear this because, like, this is literally someone saying, like, you're, you're hearing evangelism take place. And, and, and the, the guy, and I'm like, what are they going to say? And the, the first thing they say, the first thing you need to know about God is sin. And I thought, oh, we could have had that one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, they, and they say, the first thing you need to know about God is sin. And, God, and uh, sin entered the world through humanity and ruined God's good creation. And God can't look at you. Uh, Jesus came down to earth and rectified that sin. And now through Jesus, you can have a relationship with God. That's their understanding. They, were, they did a well and faithful job of explaining that theology that, under, that a lot of people uh, is central to them. That is not the United Methodist way that conversation goes. Allow me to share it. Um, the first thing that you need to know about God is grace. The first thing you need to know about God is grace, and it is the free gift of love and mercy that God gives to you because God wants you to have it. It's not something you did to earn. It's not something you're good enough for. God gives it to you because that's who God is. It is active in your life before you're ever aware of it. We call it prevenient grace. It's a working in you. Call it God beckoning you. Call it God nudging you, whatever. God is in your life before you realize it. That's why babies are baptized in these churches. God's grace continues to work to you and through his God's justifying grace that's made perfect in Jesus Christ. It destroys whatever gulf that sin or self-doubt or self-loathing or not being worth it has erupted in your life. That justifying grace grace, when you accept it, reconciles you perfectly and completely and forever with God. That is God's grace at work and empowered through Jesus Christ. And it's not done there. God's grace continues to work from that moment until you join the saints in heaven. It does, the God's grace, we call it sanctifying grace, that nudges you, that pushes you, that shapes you, that forms you, that you open up to and respond to, that molds you every day a little bit closer to the model of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's God's work active in you that you accept. We call it sanctifying grace. Sanctifying means saint-making. God? That is God's sanctifying grace. That is who God is. I want you to know that. That is who we celebrate here. We celebrate the saints. We celebrate the people who have heard that call, who have felt that nudge, and they say yes. In doing so, you're being invited into something that actually lasts. That's actually permanent. We get to be a part of the vision that you see at work in Revelation and in John. You get to understand in a deeper and more intimate way than ever that we are all connected, saying yes 
to that grace is what connects you. You get invited to the one story that actually is going to last because I promise you this, there'll be one day that the last American flag comes down from the last pole for the last time. The church in Ephesus, the church in Colossia, the church in Thessalonica, the church in Galatia, the churches that we read letters to in the, old, in the New Testament are all gone. Before too long, every person who has ever heard your name or thought about you will be dead. But what you have the opportunity to do is to join with God's heavenly choir forever. And this is good news. Today is All Saints Day. We gather and celebrate the people in the last year to come before us, people who will come after us, the people in this room today who feel that grace of God and say, yes, All Saints Day is when we can stand up with our own voice and in our own hearts and say, I hear you, God. Yes. Pray with me, please. God, it is us, your humble saints, gathered in reverence of your work, your beautiful creation, your salvation through Jesus Christ, and your innovating presence through the Holy Spirit. God, help us say yes to your call, to recognize your presence, to be one with your saints in heaven. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we all pray and say together the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.